Well, good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Second Sunday in Advent. Boy, time, time is flying, isn't it? Uh, just a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, big thank you again to everybody that helped get our sanctuary ready for the Advent season. And I don't know if you noted when you pulled up to 275 Bancroft Street this morning, but there is a nativity scene that has been put up courtesy of a guy who goes by the initials of SL, Mr. Linky. Thank you very much for installing that. Appreciate it. And again, everybody that does all the big and the small things, both in front and behind the scenes, thank you very much. Um, interesting development. Last Sunday when I was watching Steve put up the nativity scene, I watched, walked over to our red uh, blessing box, and lo and behold, next to there was a stroller that somebody had set next to that box and put in a bunch of uh, food and items for a young child. And that has all come as a result, I believe, of, of not only the great need that is out there, given what we're going through, but I think also the, the great article that you may have seen in the Tri-City Times. So our work and our mission outside the walls of this church is needed and is recognized, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, just a few more housekeeping items. Um, uh, if you have an offering, there is an offering plate out in the Bancroft Street entrance. Uh, again, thank you for continuing your morning tithes and offerings. Um, also, uh, next Sunday is the drawing for our Advent fundraiser that goes to uh, two causes here in Lapeer County, one being our food pantry. So you, if you haven't already done so, please go and uh, purchase some raffle tickets after the service with proper social distancing, of course, in place, uh, and be ready uh, to uh, pick up some very nice prizes that Thelma has, as she always does every year, uh, put together. Also, um, just another reminder um, that right after the benediction today, as we love our neighbors as ourselves by wearing a mask and social distancing, that after the benediction, we ask you to kindly just take your conversation outside um, uh, so we can keep uh, staying safe. Uh, it's real easy to forget. Uh, I know I've been guilty, so uh, thank you for doing that. Also, um, one final comment I just wanted to make. Um, hope everybody is doing well. And um, we'll begin our service in just a few minutes. But first, does anybody have any announcements they'd like to make? Yes, Barb. Okay. Okay, please take note uh, for that new beginnings uh, part of our service that we'll conclude later on. And uh, Barb, thank you for all your work in that regard and setting that up. Yes, Ruth. Okay, please take note of that. 
Other announcements, concerns? Okay, Chris, good to see you here this morning and, and others. Also, a big hello to those who are watching us on Zoom this morning, Rod and others, and uh, anybody else joining us here on Facebook, welcome. Uh, just a reminder, we are offering communion today, so if you are watching, listening from home, uh, please gather your famous and favorite morning beverage and a piece of bread so you can partake with us in the Holy Sacrament of Communion. So with that, we will begin our service today with the lighting of our Advent candle. Uh, Steve, if you want to come forward. If you remember last week, uh, we lit our first candle. And uh, today, with your help, we will be doing our reading and our lighting concerning our second Advent candle. So I call your attention to the screen and let us begin. Listen, can you hear? We can hear the sound of God's comfort. We can hear God's tenderness to the people. The prophet tells us God makes straight what is crooked. Glory will be revealed in peace. And today, we light the candle, the special candle of peace that follows the candle we lit before here on the second Sunday in Advent. Two more Sundays to go, and of course, the Christ candle in the center. Today, the candle of peace. Thank you, Steve. Let us pray. Dear God, as we journey down this Advent road, grant us the courage to make peace. Peace in our hearts, peace in our homes, and peace in our communities. Amen. Now, would you please allow me to have you stand or stand in spirit as we begin our service with our call to worship. The words, of course, on our screen up front, underlined for, for all of you. We come to prepare the way, the way for Christ, the hope of Christ, the peace of Christ, to enter our world, to enter our hearts. We cry out together in the wilderness, the kingdom of heaven has come near. We come to be part of the light, the light that shines in the darkness. And as sinful people, as sinful people, we pause for a moment in silence to acknowledge that we have fallen short. As sinful people, let us pray together and say these words as one. God, we have not lived as your people. We serve many masters, yet find no hope in them. Forgive us, heal us of our brokenness, so we might be the hope and love people need in their lives, even as Jesus Christ brought these gifts to us, calling us to be faithful with the grace, peace, and joy entrusted to us. Friends, hear these words. Let all of us be kind, tender-hearted, and gentle toward each other, forgiving as God has forgiven us. We are God's beloved children. Let us model God's grace and love in our hearts. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. And now, would you please join me in singing our opening hymn. It is number 117, Lift Up Your Heads, O Mighty Gates. Lift up your hearts, so mighty gates, behold the glorious ruler waits, the sovereign one is 
is drawing near the savior of the world is seen fling wide the portals of your heart make it a temple set apart from earthly Would you please be seated? Thank you, Steve. Well, it's comforting to see the peace candle lit this morning. Comforting to see all of you, the banners that, of course, reflect the lighting of the candles that we have over the four Sundays of Advent, and, of course, the wonderful Christmas tree that we have. It uh, gives us peace, a lot of much-needed peace, I think, right now. So as we lit the candle of peace this morning, we hear a little bit from the prophet Joel, who speaks a little bit about this word peace that we're going to look at today. But as we heard those words just now from Steve, from Joel, it's important to know what's lurking in the background, what has motivated Joel to write these words this morning. And as we ponder the word peace and hear Joel speak about it. Joel if you remember, is a prophet. He's a learned interpreter of sacred text. Like the prophets, he quotes the Torah and other prophets. And in his short book today, very short Joel book, I might add, he looks at what other prophets have written and brings in the Torah. And today in scripture, he is speaking to the people of Israel. Now, if you recall, we've looked at the prophets of other books over the last few weeks, and we've heard their words during the time that the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. Today it's different. 
Today, Joel is speaking to people who have just returned from the Babylonian exile, and they are back in Israel after enduring a very long period in exile. If you recall, it was a lonely time. People were isolated, of course, through generations during the Babylonian exile. So the people have come back. They're looking at their home, and they're shell-shocked. They are shocked at the state of affairs that they find their homeland in. It's not expected. Oh, let me put it to you this way. They did not expect it to be as gloomy as it was. They looked around and saw buildings and cities in ruins, all the basic institutions of society destroyed, and of course, needing one massive rebuild. There was a lot of work to be done. So that's our backdrop as the people of Israel hear these words from Joel this morning. Now, if that's not enough, Joel, prior to today's passage that Steve read, speaks about other problems that have been facing the people. From Joel chapter 1 comes these words from the prophet. Lament over the ruin of the country. Joel writes, Hear this, O elders, the leaders of society, of, of course, of the time. Hear this, O elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land, speaking to the people of Israel upon returning to their land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? What the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts have eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. It has laid waste my vines and splintered my fig trees. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it down. Their branches have turned white. The fields are devastated. The ground mourns, for the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil fails. Be dismayed, you farmers. Wail, you vine dressers, over the wheat and the barley, for the crops of the field are ruined. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land, gather them to the house of the Lord, your God, and cry out to the Lord. That sounds like a pretty bad natural disaster. Swarms of locusts coming and devastating the fields. And this disaster that Joel just spoke about talks about a bad, 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 really awesome, destructive, terrible destruction on farmers, grape growers, makers of bread and wine. And no doubt, this swarm of locusts has led to a shortage of food for the people. And of course, the environment has been impacted by these swarm of locusts. Joel, in these words, writes about a people who, on top of picking up the pieces in their destroyed land after the Babylonian exile, now facing a catastrophe of humanitarian, economic, and social justice areas, bar none. We're in our own challenges right now, aren't we? We find ourselves in a raging health emergency with COVID-19 that has killed hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens. Last Friday alone, 3,100 Americans died in a single day due to the coronavirus. People have lost loved ones. Many have recovered from the virus, but some have been left, left with lasting side effects. And of course, new cases continue to rise. Of course, we have businesses that have been closing for good because of the pandemic. Businesses struggling to stay open. The hours of employees have been cut. Many employees have lost their jobs. Funds for those who became unemployed because of COVID-19. Those funds are nearly dried up. People are working on the front lines, our doctors, our nurses, nursing staff, they're all exhausted. We have COVID-19 fatigue. I do, and I'm sure you do. 
We're tired mentally and physically, aren't we? We've been living for nearly a year with this virus. And then, of course, on top of the pandemic, our farmers, our winemakers, our growers of grapes have endured natural disasters because of our erratic climate. As a result, many people have left farming for good or gone out of business. Hundreds of thousands of acres we've seen on TV have been burned, trees destroyed. We've had flooding because of hurricanes. And of course, across the country, we continue to remain divided as a people after a brutal, all-consuming election. And then, last but not least, don't go running for the doors yet, we have war still going on. We have war and death continuing to show its ugly face in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe's Ukraine, where Russia continues to occupy that country, the eastern part. We have no peace in the world. We have no peace here at home. It almost seems like we've been in another country enduring an exile, haven't we, with all of this going on? We've been enduring an exile of doubt and sadness and fear just like the people that Joel addressed this morning. But what we've been experiencing, it is different. There are days, and I'll be very honest with you, there are days when I felt sometimes like I've been at the end of my rope. And I'm sure that's been the case with you. Just like the people of Israel were at the ends of their rope when they came back to their shattered country. So we look around, don't we? We look around and we say, when is this all going to end? When is this going to get better? I mean, come on. We have the constant drumbeat of pain and anguish and strife and conflict, and we say, when will it stop? We also ask ourselves, how do we cope? Sure, we have our family, our friends, and our spouses, but how do we really cope from all of this? Where does our help come from? That's the same question, undoubtedly, that Joel gets asked by the Israelites after seeing his words and living his words, locusts and all and destroyed country and all. So my friends, where do we turn to? Who do we look at to help see things restored once again and see the devastation and the anguish around us removed? Sure, we keep coping day in and day out from whatever comes our way. But after a while, when you reach the end of your rope, where does the light come from in the darkness to give us peace and hope? Joel today tells us as a people and the people of his time who were also at the end of their ropes where to find hope and peace in our God and creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, the one who has never left us and who was always present. The prophet paints a wonderful, beautiful word and pictures today of God's promise and faithfulness to us, especially for these times when we're feeling at the end of our ropes. Joel passes on to us these words that we heard Steve read, and let me emphasize to them again, you again because they are important ones. After Joel sets the table about the devastation that the Israelites face and talks about the natural disaster of the locusts, he starts with these words, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Yet even now signals a big change for the good, a complete turnaround to what the tough times we are facing now, just like the Israelites faced. Joel tells us in his prophetic response to these challenging times to the Israelites and us to come together as a collective community. That's what we need to do. And that's what we're doing here this morning. Joel reminds us that God will renew us and restore us and the world around us. Those trees that burned during the summer will grow back in those natural disasters. The waters from the hurricanes that went over levees and flooded homes, those waters will recede. 
our pain will subside. So let us turn to God for our God that creates, created us, of course. Our God creates, but our God also renews. So let us turn to God that gives us peace amidst our anguish and challenges us. A God who says, bring your pain to me, your God. Bring to me your losses and your sadness. Give it to God. That's what our Creator implores us this morning to do in every day. More importantly, Joel tells us that we have a God that proclaims that the present that we find ourselves in does not define the future. The future is bright because of God, and we need to keep reminding ourselves of that. Joel says to us this morning these words from God. God, God being with us in our hard times, and especially after we reveal our own lament and sadness to our Creator. Joel says these words. I will, I will emphasize on will. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And then Joel also says this. The Holy Spirit is with us. With us now, always. And will be with us to help recover whatever we have faced. That, my friends, is peace. That, my friends, is hope. Also behind Joel's words this morning is the strong presence of faith. In Hebrews, we hear that faith is this. It believes what God says. It commits to do what God requires. And trusts, trusts in and rests on what God promises. In the passage that we heard in Joel this morning in verses 12 through 13, followed by a beautiful promise in verses 28 through 29, reminds us of that, especially in the midst of these challenging, harrowing times. Joel says, return to the Lord your God, because God is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love. Okay, so what does that look like? What does that graciousness and abounding in steadfast love look like? What does it look like? All of that, and more importantly, to live into all of that by faith. We're here now doing it in worship of the one true God. And we live by faith, trusting in the knowledge that God is with us every step of the way. I don't know if you noticed this in the words that Steve read this morning, but Joel said in these words to us, as he does to the Israelites, rend R-E-N-D, rend your hearts. Or, in other words, bring your heart and spirit to God. So let's be honest with each other. Giving ourselves to God doesn't mean we're going to avoid hard times. But by rendering our hearts to God, we are given the endurance to persist through another day of hardship. So rend your hearts, your anguish, to God. In just a few weeks, we celebrate the birth of a child. The birth of a child will become the savior of the world, the prince of peace. Let us be mindful of that. Let us think about that as we continue moving forward, knowing that God is ever faithful. God is always moving with us and to us. The God we proclaim, the God we know most fully in Jesus Christ, fights back against all that is dark and awful in us and around us. And this God, like a shepherd, cares tenderly for us, the flock, carrying us when we are weary, leading us when we have lost our way. We have with God comfort in the midst of our grief, and in God, we have hope and peace in the face of any and all fear. 
Advent is a time when we have hope. Yes, the optimistic kind of hope, of course, but also, to be real, a hope that acknowledges the pain of our present reality and a light that lets us be illuminated by God's presence in the midst of any sorrow and pain. In the midst of our darkness this Advent season, light breaks in. Light breaks in. Joel shows us that in the midst of despair, hope erupts. Peace is with us because God is with us. Emmanuel. Christ comes as the Prince of Peace for when we are at the end of our rope and stays with us in our darkness through the light of God. Amen. Would you please pray with me? God, we gather with you now today with our first two Advent candles lit, awaiting the birth and celebrating the birth of the Prince of Peace. Gather with us and be with us, especially in this sanctuary this morning and, of course, when we leave here today as people who have been bruised and battered by the challenges and strife around us. Let us bask in your light of hope and peace and hear as we rend, render to you our hopes, our fears, our sorrows, and our dreams. Lord, continue to help heal us and heal the wars and the strife that's impacting our country and the world. And Lord, we're mindful of the people around us just by our food pantry that there is hunger in our midst. And we thank you for continuing to give us the resources to feed the least among us. God, we're mindful too that there are people inside and outside the walls of this church that are hurting, suffering loss in many areas. Be with them and strengthen them. And we especially pray for people in our congregation who have lost loved ones and our mourning during this holiday time. We ask you to be with our men and women that are serving in the military and to all those that are dealing with health challenges. Heal them and be with them and especially let them feel your loving touch during these troubling times. And Lord, we stop now and we say to you, either out loud or in silence, our own prayers and petitions to you. God of peace, God of hope, we have presented, we have rendered to you our petitions. Let us render to you now the prayer that your son taught us. We say in unison together, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks to all of you and our members who are listening from home for your tithes and offerings. 
I offer this blessing, this prayer, on behalf of us all for what we have received. God, we recognize that Jesus Christ, the shepherd that is to come in Advent, cares for us, providing all we need in abundance. The shepherd calls us to love one another in truth and action. God, may our gifts reflect our trust in the shepherd's care. And may these offerings that are presented to us show our willingness to love one another. Amen. Now we offer our holy sacrament of communion on this second Sunday in Advent. So as folks at home gather together these elements, let us pause now and hear these words. We remember those words that were said in that intimate room thousands of years ago when Jesus was gathered with his closest friends. And he said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. In company with all who hunger for spiritual food, we come to this table today, our table at home, to know the risen Christ in the sharing of life-giving bread and wine. Let us pray. Holy God, our living creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star, we thank you for your constant love and for all that you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, especially for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being to be our Savior. God, we praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for calling forth your church for its mission in the world. Gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with the entire family of your faithful everywhere. Come, Holy Spirit, bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking wherever our table may be, so that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his friends and disciples, and said this, This is my body that has been broken for you. When you eat of this, every time, eat and remember me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for all of you for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink from this cup, think of me. Think of me. By eating our bread and drinking from our cup, we proclaim Christ's death and we celebrate the resurrection and we await the coming of Christ again. I now invite you to partake with the bread, with your communion kit or whatever you have at home. Eat from the bread and think of Jesus.
now as you drink from your cup, think of Christ. Think of Christ. I ask you to pray this communion prayer with me that is found on the screen. Let us say together, we thank you, most holy God, for the refreshment at your table where, saints, we have received all Christ's gifts. Provide for your church on earth a strong faith and increased love for one another. Give us the grace to praise you with our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. And now let us rise as we will now sing our closing hymn. It is number 125. I know you know it. A little different version than what we're used to, but from our new century hymnal, it is Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high singing singing Come to Bethlehem and see Christ whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, God our world now entering.
Friends, hear now this benediction, and before I give it a reminder to please leave the building uh, immediately following the, the benediction uh, to see Barb and to prepare for what happens afterwards. Go from this place today, gathered with the lights of peace and hope. Go and embody that in the world, and render to God your anguish, your pain, and your suffering, and know that God is always walking with us as light in the darkness, now and forever. Amen. Go, 